Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, I'm Yasha. I work here at uh, uh, Technology and Research in the Speech Research Group, and uh, I've known John for many years. Uh, he was a postdoc at Microsoft Research for one year ages ago. Um, he was five years doing noise robustness and other great things at IBM. And these days, he leads the speech and audio group at Mitsubishi Electric uh, Labs down in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, so John is here to talk about some neat results that he gave us a preview of last week. And hopefully, we'll go into some details and we'll have lots of fun. John? Thank Dr. you, Hershey. Yasha. Thank you, Dr. Drapo. Uh, so uh, please uh, feel free to interrupt and have me writing on the whiteboard and things like that because uh, not everything may be perfectly clear. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so this is a talk about uh, separation of uh, signals um, and specifically using a special new network we came up with for doing embeddings. Um, this is actually... Uh, one of those ideas that uh, came up a long time ago and we were just sort of like expecting it to get scooped sometime before we got around to getting it out. But as far as we know, it hasn't. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, we got lucky. Um, uh, but it's kind of an obvious idea in retrospect and so uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, someone else has done similar things. Uh, so the thing about uh, separating sound is that when, when you look at the spectrogram of the uh, two signals, so this is just like one frame of a mixture of a male and a female speaker um, talking at the same time, and both voiced things. Uh, so the, the black line is the sort of log spectrum of the mixture. The red one is uh, speaker one spectrum, the female one, and the blue one is speaker two, so you can see sort of there's harmonics and some overall structure that people call formants. Um, but the main thing to notice is that like uh, if you look at the black line versus the red and blue lines, it, the black line sits just about at the max of the two. And uh, only when they're very close to each other do you really see any discrepancy in that pattern. Uh, but in, in most of the areas, one thing dominates and the other thing uh, is completely, completely obscured. Um, so uh, you could sort of say that if you, if you knew that mask, uh, then sort of the observation went under one part of the mask is the source that that mask corresponds to, and the observations on the other part of the mask are, are essentially very accurate representation of the source that that um, mask corresponds to. And, and basically, once you have the mask, uh, you really have all the information that the spectrogram contains about each of the sources. There is no other information because this stuff down here is gone. It's not there. It's like it's obscured. So, so uh, it's kind of just to motivate. Like, why do we care about mass? Well, if you had the mass, it's pr pretty much everything you can know about all of the sources. Uh, so, just taking that to a spectrogram. Uh, so, this is like a mixture of three sources, and this is the masking pattern for those, the sort of oracle masking pattern for those sources, where each of those sources dominates in time and frequency. So time, frequency, log spectrogram, and just sort of discrete mask. And um, you can see it's kind of intricate, and they overlap in intricate ways. So it's not something where region-based sort of methods could really find those special regions. And the other thing that's special about these regions is that they're a function of both of the sources, like which one is the maximum, requires looking at all of the magnitudes of all the sources. Um, but if you had that masking pattern, you could sort of use that to see all of the visible information for each of the sources. And the rest of the information for those sources is, is essentially lost. You, you have no hope of getting it anyway. Your definition of is just the max, which source the, uh, has the biggest energy? Or is it like, yes. So. Uh, so one of the things that we discovered <laughs> recently is that actually there's not one unique nice way to define a mask for multiple sources. For two sources, it's very clear. One, whichever signal has the highest energy. Uh, for multiple sources, 
It could be the case that it's kind of a uniform distribution over a bunch of sources. And then so no one of them dominates because the sum of any of, of the rest of them is always going to be greater than each of the individual sources. So in, in that case, you'd kind of have to sort of have a neutral value or just set, set the mass to zero for that source. So you'd have multiple sources that have a zero value. But here we're going to sort of like pretend that problem doesn't exist. The follow-up question, you have four colors on this graph. Oh, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, so this is the silence source. So this uh, is a silence source where you assume everything else is dropped below the background. We actually did special processing to try not to worry about the silence source. The silence. It could normally this would be some background noise, so you could call it a noise source. And it does sort of dominate in those regions. So you could treat that as a fourth class. That would be a reasonable thing to do. But we didn't do that because it was too reasonable. So we just essentially we get rid of that and pretend it does it's not there. Because at least that's one thing you can infer from the mixer is you know where the silence is. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna tell you about is how we uh, developed a neural network that we trained on two speaker mixtures, and then we tested on this mixture, and it sort of does something reasonable for separating three sources. So this is the oracle, and this is the sort of separated masks. And you can see it makes some mistakes, but uh, by and large, it does pretty well at, at you know, like especially the yellow one there, I guess, must be the female one. And there's two male ones that get a little confused together. Uh, but still, it's pretty shocking that you can, to us, you know, that you can train a neural network that we usually think of as having a sort of fixed number of inputs and outputs and train it on two sources, which is a particular task that has a fixed number of labels, and then use it in this other task without modifying the network at all. In fact, we just change one parameter, like the number of classes you want to get out. Um, uh, so uh, in a nutshell, I'll just describe what it is, and then we'll backtrack and go through like the whole history of the world and everything. Um, so basically what it does is for each of those time frequency bins, the output is an embedding vector that's trained so that if it's, so if two different time frequency bins are from the same source, those embedding vectors should match. And if they're from different sources, they should not match. And uh, by having the, structuring the output like that, we solve what we call the permutation problem. Like rather than saying the network should have one output for source one and another output for source two and another output for source three, and should do like some soft max over those sources, uh, that would require that it know where to put source one and source two and source three. But if they're all of the same class, like how can it determine where it should put those? And how can it make an executive decision like, okay, I started putting this source here, so now I'm gonna, now I have to stay consistent with that uh, versus putting the other source there and I have to stay consistent with that. So it, it's a lot of cognitive load for the network that we're trying to avoid. Uh, so we also hope that this can, this kind of embedding approach might well, first of all, as I showed, sort of help it generalize the different numbers of sources, but maybe it could even be sort of source independent. Like you can imagine training this thing on many, many different kinds of sources. It actually doesn't care what the class labels of the sources are. All it cares is that you know where they belong in the spectrum. So you could potentially train it on a lot of different things. We can incorporate microphone array information. So that's, that's what we're aiming for with this talk. So, so going back into the ancient history, uh, Especially since uh, reason, one reason I'm going back here is because there was some work at MSR recently that kind of solved the problem of getting neural networks to separate sources, at least for the purpose of recognition. So that was uh, Yasha and Mike and uh, Dong Yu and uh, Chao Wang that did some things like that. And they were, it was on the same task that we had done this work before. There's a few reasons for presenting this, but so I'll just go through it quickly. It's like one sort of way you could think of handling this problem is having models for each of the sources. So imagine if it's speech, you could have a speech model for each of the sources that are there. And, and you, that could be something that you hypothesize. You could say, I think there's two sources, so I'll start up a two source model. Or I think there's three sources, I'll start up a three source model. You know, you could automatically determine the model class using some model selection techniques. So, so what kind of models could you use? So, one thing that we did in the past with uh, colleagues at IBM was we had a speech model, so we had like kind of a grammar-based system. It had state transitions, so it was like a very sparse hidden markup model. And then we had an acoustic model that was log spectrum domain, and that itself had some sort of shared uh, GMM states, and then the observations are just Gaussians. And then we combine those models together in a kind of factorial model, one for each source, and then you have the observation. And uh, to make things possible to 
extend to multiple sources and be a little bit tractable, we use this max interaction function, which just says, uh, I'm going to take the max of all the inputs, and uh, that's going to be the observation. So we say the observation is just delta, the probability of the observation, the probability density of the observation is just a delta function at the max of, the, of all of the latent inputs, uh, sources. Um, so that's completely tractable to compute that with, um, with Gaussians. Um, so the posterior just has this funny shape. It's just a, a max multiplied by the prior, which is Gaussian, in, in, in the sources for a, a given frequency. Uh, so um, now uh, what about actually inferring the states and, and these masks, this probability that one source dominates? Uh, so again, we have the max interaction thing, and then we have the states of the model. So let's say we have k models, and we have a bunch of discrete states. Each model has n states, and let's say there's a transition matrix, n by n. And then uh, for each um, time and frequency, there's that, uh, in the posterior, you have this probability that one source dominates it or, or, or the other. And that posterior, so for each time and frequency, you have the k sources. So you have, a, it's just a multinomial that has a, a value, probability value for each of the k sources. Um, but unfortunately, like if you were to do exact inference, which would be silly, uh, the, uh, it would be completely intractable. It's all exponential, like the, the mass states, you know, so if you have n masks then, and two sources, you have two to the n possible mass variables that you would have to explore. And, and each of the mask variables depends on the configuration of all the states, of all of the sources. Uh, so you have this nice, uh, oops, part of my animation is a little stale. So you have this nice bar bipartite graph, uh, and what we know, like, if you, you know, sort of think about restricted Boltzmann machine, right? If you know one of the vectors, then the, uh, inferring the other one is trivial because they're all independent, conditional condition on one of them. So even though the posterior has this horrible sort of fully connected kind of structure, if we know one of the things, like we know the source states, then all we have to do is compare those little Gaussians for that state and see which one is the max. And if we have the mass states, then all we have to do is uh, sort of ignore the areas that are massed out for each of the sources, and then we can look at the sources independently and to determine what their states are. So then we just have like HMM kind of complexity. Um, so the two conclusions I wanted to draw from that is like, we could do what we did, which was to do like a variational inference uh, alternating between mask inference and, and source state inferences. Uh, also, if we can get good masks, we're kind of almost done. Like that's like, it's all, Inferring source states or whatever else you want to do with those sources, I impute the missing values, whatever it is you want to do, that's all super tractable once you know the masks, if you can get them correct. So that was kind of one of the inspirations. Like, we want to, let's try to develop algorithms and get the mask, and then we'll go back to our crazy graphical models or whatever to, to do the refinement after that. And so we did this stuff, uh, this uh, uh, variational approach to try to get past just doing two speakers. Um, so originally we did this two speaker case back in the days, like this is, this is, it's kind of a toy task. So, uh, you know, you take it for, uh, with a grain of salt, but so human performance on this task was about here and, and we were able to do better than the sort of recorded human performance by doing exact, uh, Viterbi in a two, uh, speaker factorial HMM using a lot of tricks to speed it up. And then we had different uh, variations of that. And one of them was this very, uh, well, two of these, the red one and, and the purple one. These are both different variational approaches about alternating between masks inference and uh, state inference. And in particular, we came up with ways of where the variational parameters could have a sort of a particular complexity. So you could vary the complexity and see whether you could get similar results to the exact algorithm. And, and so for this case, we were able to, you know, this was the exact, thing that corresponded to uh, this reduced one. And you know, this one had 65K uh, things to consider in terms of state combinations. And this one just had sort of 256 separate mask values to consider. Uh, and we do, we do just as well, even though we're reducing the complexity. So that's great. And then um, uh, you guys, uh, Yasha and Mike and uh, Dong and uh, Chow, uh, recently, did a two-speaker DNN acoustic model. So not, not for, our approach was separate and then recognize, and their approach was to just 
recognize. And they use some nice uh, techniques to solve the permutation problem partially when doing, so doing state inference and decide, uh, computing the probability of the states of the different sources and then running a Viterbi to sort of unravel and get the associations across time to solve the permutation problem. And I'm not sure exactly wh where their score would fit in on here, but uh, uh, it's kind of off the chart. And then, uh, but the direction that we went with this was to, do, uh, oops, as I said, to do this kind of variational thing so we could get beyond two speakers. So two different directions. Uh, but we wanted something that could be generalized to an arbitrary number of speakers. So we did that. Um, it would be very complex. Let me just give you demos. Play wide at S6 now. Again. You can hear what. Bin wide at S6 now. How things Play used to work. Play wide at I1 now. Leg in J0 again. Okay, so it works really pretty well, um, actually. And I, I don't think we're back to there with the embedding approach. So we're, we're just kind of uh, catching up. Of course, this thing has a very constrained language model. and All, all these things matter a lot. So uh, it, it's not clear if the two things can even be compared. Also, closed speaker set and so on. So we didn't even use the same data because it just had too many assumptions. You know, closed speaker set, small number of uh, words, and, and so on. We were able to do four speakers. I won't play the demos. Um, just back to here. So uh, back to the, like, if we can get good mass, we're almost done. That's where, where we left off. And now to uh, what about DNN approaches for enhancement? Because that's almost like separation. It basically is separation, only difference being that you have two different classes. Like you have speech and you have non-speech. Uh, so what do we do for that? So we train a, a network to estimate a mask for each time frequency bin. So it has a sort of a soft max. Uh, output that uh, ideally it should be one for the for the uh, dominant speaker or dominant source, one for the speaker if that's the source, or one for the noise if that's the source for that time frequency bin. And we have to model the context. LSTMs, uh, recurrent networks are the state of the art for that. Uh, if you don't know what those are, they're hideously complex uh, networks that are recurrent that uh, are made so that the gradients pass well back in time and uh, they have gates for input, output, and forgetting. It's not clear whether all of those gates are needed. Uh, it's just something that sort of caught on and people use it. Surely there's probably a better way, but it, hey, it works and it's been implemented dozens of times, so you can just use that. Um, and that's what we used. Uh, so we've done a, a bunch of different work just doing speech enhancement using these kinds of things. And in the more intricate ones, we sort of also took up this, like, let's iterate between getting mass or reconstructing sources and doing recognition and getting states and feeding those things back. And, and that all helps incrementally. You get a little bit out of doing that kind of iteration, even though it's not a variational inference algorithm, uh, still can help. And you know, these are the kind of results. If you just, these are uh, word error rates. So if you just look at sort of the average results, like starting from basically doing nothing to doing kind of a vanilla non-negative matrix factorization type of approach, um, down to doing like a bidirectional LSTM with special objective function that considers the uh, complex domain match to the signal and feeding back in some state information after one iteration through a recognizer and things like that. Like the numbers keep keep decreasing, and here with two channel system using a little bit, bit of beam forming, we get to a slightly lower number. So that's just to show that these networks really work at this task, even though the non-stationary noise might even have some speech in it sometimes. Yes? Uh, John? So what is, uh, is your goal here going to be for speech recognition, or do you see this as improving perceptual quality for human consumption of these signals? Uh, is it, 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 can be, goal? it can be either. I, like for the, for the, you mean for the talk in general, or for? For, for your research or what you're presenting today? Yeah, I mean, I think it could be for either one. Right. It's, it's not clear. It depends, on, it'll really test dependent kind of thing. But you could use it either way and you know, you can use different objective functions to train it. Um, these things were all trained sort of in the signal do domain as enhancement things. So they actually sound pretty good and they help recognition. But if you were to sort of hook it up to the speech recognition objective function, then it could be better, it might also sort of wander away from actually doing something reasonable with the signals and give you something that wouldn't be listenable, so just some arbitrary transformation of the signals, but so might be good for recognition. Train on that enhancement for the training? Uh, these are with retraining, yeah, I believe. These are with re retraining. 
Um, so, but uh, the problem is like you can't just naively, at least, apply this to speech on speech problems because it's the same class. You could do male speech versus female speech, that works. You even do speaker A versus speaker B if you have speaker dependent model. That even kind of works. But for like same speaker independent and both can be male or female, uh, it just doesn't work. Uh, so um, as I mentioned, uh, for, for acoustic modeling, this has been kind of solved using uh, the way that the permutation was disambiguated was use the, the state of the louder source as, as a target and the state of the quieter source as a separate target and then to use, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, to use Viterbi uh, across time to link up the correct states across time. So that solves the permutation problem. Uh, it's not clear how to extend that to more than two speakers um, or how to do enhancement. Um, with that. Uh, so for enhancement, we tried, just naively uh, tried. Um, and so what we, we tried, so, so here using a, a, a BLSTM, it's a, it's a recurrent model. So you can't just sort of sort frames frame by frame. So we decided, OK, we'll put the louder whole utterance or chunk in one uh, uh, of the outputs and put the softer one in, in the other target output. Uh, that, uh, didn't really work. We're using chunks here of about 100 frames just to kind of uh, limit the globalness. Of it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> negative results in neural networks are often. So the permutation rest is yes. you don't have any way to look at continuity over time. And it's bidirectional, so we can't look at the output, although you could think that maybe by building up layers, like each la successive layer is sort of closer to the output, then eventually it could sort of infer the output. So yeah, it's not clear that it can't be solved uh, this way, but we, we couldn't do it. And so we also just, the, the simplest thing that we tried, which we thought would work, was that at training time, we just look at the two masks that were generated, and we use Oracle to pick the one that matches the best matchup between this, those outputs and the, and the two targets. We have two targets, two masks. We match them up optimally according to the objective function, and then we get gradients after that. Uh, that fails. Um, and then, if, then there's also the deeper, if you can call it a permutation problem, which is that what about the numbers of sources that are in there? Uh, how can we handle different numbers of outputs in this kind of a rigid framework? I mean, but you can imagine, you know, like you have a, it's kind of like those, uh, Dirichlet prior models, you have a bank actually, and then you put priors so that the ones that end up zero you ignore and it determines the number of classes. You could imagine doing something kind of like that. But anyway, so this is like kind of what we got with the with the deep net just training on mask estimation. Like this is the sort of Oracle output mask for two speakers, and this is what we got. And it kind of it kind of looks like it's doing something from time to time. <laughs> uh, but you know. We're asking it to label speech with one and also label the speech with zero. So <laughs> it gets a little confused. Um, so we decided to come up with something that wouldn't be as hard to uh, get to work. Uh, so I already went through this before. We're going to use embedding vectors for each time frequency bin. And kind of like comparing to the class-based approach, um, like these. Uh, v are kind of the model outputs and Y, these are just kind of very generic, so don't pay too much attention. But these, if these are sort of, we're training the network to output some, some approximations to the labels and these are the labels, that's the kind of class-based approach. Like the labels are just gonna be like an indicator for which class is, is in, uh, cor corresponds to what mask. And then instead, we're gonna do something that sort of, we wanna be able to compare the outputs for different time frequency bins in a case where they're from the same class and or compare them when they're from different classes. So we'll have an objective function more like that with the assumption that if we, once we do that kind of training, we'll be able to then tease apart which things belong together. So just to make it a little more formal, like we, if we have this sort of indicator variable Y, um, it's a rectangular matrix. So the row is the, which time frequency bin it is and the C is sort of which for that utterance, which of the different sources that went into that utterance it is. Uh, those can be permuted around because of the way that we're gonna make that, that into an objective function. Uh, so we wanna be uh, independent of the 
ordering of the, ro of the columns of y. Um, uh, so when we take the outer product of y, that, that gives us something that's independent of the permutations. If you multiply y by a permutation, um, then take the outer products, you get the same A. So, and it turns out we can think of this A as an ideal affinity matrix. If, if you think about sort of cl spectral clustering type of approaches, that you have an affinity matrix. The ideal one would be one where things that are in the same cluster have a value of one in A. So the Aij would be one if it's in the same class, and it would be zero otherwise. And that way, um, it's easy to think about sort of permuting the rows and columns around a, of this A so that you get a block diagonal structure, which is exactly sort of the ideal spectral clustering uh, input, because that only ha it has rank, and it's the number of blocks, and each eigenvector is just an indicator for where the, that block occurs, where that class occurs. Uh, so if we know A, we can just recover Y. Um, so we're going to approximate A using some function. Um, if we were to just sort of naively approximate the whole big A, uh, you know, like saying we have the, the sort of ideal A and we're going to approximate it with some output of the network, it would be just too big. So instead of doing that, we, we do kind of like similar to what people do in spectral clustering, we use a low rank approximation. But instead of kind of like our, the philosophy nowadays is instead of like having a complicated model and then approximating it, we're going to start off with a model that would be considered an approximation to the original thing and train that thing. We want to train the approximation because that's our new model. So we have an approximate model, which is that we're just going to use this kind of a uh, construction for the affinity matrix. So note that this is nothing like uh, the spectral clustering way of doing things, which would have like a local kernel, and that leads to a sparse affinity matrix, which then has to be uh, decomposed into eigenvectors in order to sort of complete the sparse blocks and sort of fill them out into being full blocks. Instead of that, we're going to train the network so that this thing gives us full blocks. That means it's going to give us dense clusters. That's, that's the goal. So uh, getting into the precise thing that we actually do. Uh, so we have some input features. And we're just sort of here, since we're using bidirectional LSTM, you could just think of the output at a given time and frequency as sort of dependent on the whole spectrogram. Um, and so H is our network with parameters theta. and this is our objective function. So we want our VVT to approximate YYT. That's, that's what we said we would do. Uh, if you sort of go through the algebra, you can see that as saying that um, for things that are in the same class, we just want them to be close together. This, this is just an extra. This actually ends up just being N once you do the math and have the proper weighing on these things. Uh, and then this guy um, says that if they're in different classes, we'd like their distances to be further apart, like close to two, even though um, they can't quite be that far apart. They're unit vectors in, in our formulation. Um, so uh, another way to think about this objective function is that uh, aside from just some little weights for the number of items in each class, this is exactly the um, um, k-means objective function as a function of y, the, uh, the assignment of points to classes. So at training time, Given the assignment, we're training v uh, using the k-means objective function. And at test time, we hold the parameters constant, and we optimize on y. We try to find the assignment that reduces the same objective function. So that way, we can feel confident that what we're training it to do is actually the right thing for the procedure that we do at test time. I want to make sure I understand your uh, notation here. The vi's are vectors. The embeddings? Yes. Uh, so, and then uh, vik would be, k would be like a time-like variable, or? Uh, i is the time frequency index, and k is the embedding dimension. So they're kind of okay. like row vectors. And they sit it's sort of as rows inside of v. So vvt compares for each time frequency, it compares it to each other time frequency. So vvt is a big matrix, way too big to, have, to actually uh, use uh, explicitly. But fortunately, this is just a, you know, Frobenius norm, uh, you know, squared error type of function, and it, it turns out like actually you never you don't have to actually instantiate that big matrix because of that. So uh, the norm uh, of vi is always one, right? 
generalize this. Yeah, the norm of, yeah. So each so this row is... that vi minus vj is just the cosine angle. Exactly, between. exactly. And then... Yeah. But times, that, times, not minus, right? The, the product of vi and vj is the cosine of the angle. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But, but vi minus vj is just 1 plus 1 plus the cosine. Yeah, it's 2 minus 2 times the cosine of the angle, exactly. Yeah. So the maximum of this cosine should be something between negative 1 and 1, right? And then you want to... Yeah, it's like, 1 if they're the same, right? Uh, yeah. The angle will be 0 and then the cosine, so then you'll get, you'll get 0, right? These will be the same vector. This, this will be 0. Just don't understand why, why you subtract here negative 2. What's this, the intuition for this? Uh, this just, well, first of all, this is just, all I'm doing is doing the yeah. algebra of this to get down here. Uh, so this is kind of, but the intuition you could say, okay, well, this is a distance over all of the ij. So it's saying that, um, you know, we'd like this distance, the squared distance, to be close to 2. So in other words, we want it to be larger because it can never be 2. But but what Actually, you, uh, the, but what we but the value you get is just one plus one plus the cosine. Give me angle. two in there, right? So what you get is just the okay. cosine angle, right? Two, because you'll get. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. So so this will this this quantity is uh, this quantity b i minus v j squared As is two, two minus, minus two minus times the cosine. The cosine. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Right. So this will be zero if they're if they're the same. So and. Uh, Otherwise, it'll be larger than zero. Zero is the smallest it can be. Obviously, because it's a distance. Okay. Yeah, but because I saw like some other more intuitive objective function, which are just trying to like maximize the similarity between items in the same class and minimize the ones that are in negative and the not in the same class mm -hmm. and I'm trying to see what could be the difference in the optimization between those two objective functions I see well you know people often want to put like a hinge loss on this type of things because yeah. like you want something to be far away but you don't really care how far away it is as long as it's further than anything else in that cluster like, yeah. so you know with a margin you could have a hinge loss, uh, and then you don't care after that, which might be more robust. The problem is, like, you cannot put a hinge loss on this, and then also get the fact that this low rank construction means that the derivative is very simple, and that the, um, you know, in fact, that this likelihood itself is just VTV minus two times VTY, right, plus uh, YTY, which all of which are k by k for being a storm. So very simple and. Uh, there's no n by n. So n by n is this astronomically large thing that we want to avoid computing at all costs. But this thing is all, it's just a Frobenius where you can rearrange all the terms. Um, make it, make it, uh, use the, multiply the large dimensions first, basically. Uh, so, so this is saying for all points, we want them to spread out. Otherwise, there's a it's kind of a trivial solution, right? If we, if we don't have this term, then we could just put them all zero, or put them all at the same place, right? And then, then, then all the things that are in the same class will have a minimum distance, and we're great. But we want them to be different. So, so this one just spreads everything out. This one says things in the same class must be compact. There may be other, there are other ways of uh, interpreting this too. I kind of skipped some lines there, but um, so this is just says what I just said, I guess. So. It's same as k-means objective and uh, similar to spectral clustering. Um, but now, because we're training it to be uh, compact, the, the, the clustering is actually much easier. You actually don't need to. So like you think of spectral clustering as kind of like trying to fill out those block diagonal things. Um, you know, you can think of it as taking the matrix, the affinity matrix, to a large power because you need to spread throughout the cluster. If you think of it as a transition matrix, is one way of thinking about spectral, what spectral clustering does. You have a sparse transition matrix, but still think that you have a connected set for each cluster. And then by following through that transition matrix and linking up things across multiple transitions, you get back to a block diagonal thing. But this should be close, you know, we're training it to be close to block diagonal in the first place, so it doesn't require as much processing to, to do the decoding kind of thing. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is just saying what I said, like you can rearrange this thing um, to do the uh, large um, vector multiplies first, and, and that way it actually much less complex than actually, and, and memory-wise, much less space than, than storing that whole VBT thing. You don't actually have to do that at all. The gradient is also very simple and cheap to compute. And the rest of the gradient is just your, whatever your network is. It doesn't have to be LSTMs. It could be convolutional networks, whatever. So we don't get into the gradients for that part. Gradient, uh, oh, yeah. At, uh, we left off the gradient of the normalization. That's, that's another thing. So you, just, so you have each row of V is a unit norm. So you just have the gradient of you know, V over its uh, length, uh, which is just like a, it's like a softmax-like gradient. The only funny thing is that uh, since uh, it's... It's right? So it has to be... You have to follow the manifold. Well, uh, the way it's implemented is that you have um, a transformation of from, coming from the network, which is then normalized to be unit length. And that's just the forward procedure of the neural network. So in reverse, it's not, we don't consider it an optimization problem with the constraint. That's, that's just how the network works. It outputs something that gets normalized. So to back propagate, we just take the gradient of that. This is a simple gradient. The only, the only funny thing is like since it's a sphere, uh, kind of normalization, like all gradients are sort of stepping off the sphere a little bit. So it might be good to normalize your weight matrix. So, um, since actually, you know, you could, the weight matrix for each of those uh, uh, rows of V, actually it doesn't matter what the scale that is. If you multiply it by some number, uh, it's, the output is going to be normalized anyway. So it's invariant to that scale. So all derivatives will be tangent to that surface, but you'll always be stepping off. But you can always renormalize the weight matrix. Um, so in, in essence, you can always stay on the sphere. Uh, so what we do is train it on 100 frame chunks. Um, That's just what we did in the experiment because we were going to try the sort of uh, SVD approach, the sort of spectral clustering-like approach. And you can't just can't do that on something that's too big. Um, uh, so we trained, limited it to 100 frame chunks during training. And then we tried um, clustering within each chunk of frames separately and then uh, hooking up the results, resolving permutations after that, or we tried just using um, global k-means. So the global k-means is the actual only thing in here that doesn't use any oracle information at all. If we, when we did the individual uh, chunks, uh, we used the best possible permutation of each chunk. And uh, we also had a method that did that automatically, but somehow it didn't end up in the table. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Uh, but that can, that can be done too. It's not hard to actually come out with a nice uh, version of k-means that if you have overlapping chunks that you can sort of uh, satisfy the, the assignment constraints of, of k-means so that they're consistent across chunks but allow the centroids to be different for each different chunk. So you could imagine the, the, the embedding sort of evolving over time and, but the, the, you're uh, linking them up by enforcing the same assignments across chunks even though the centroids are different. Okay, so then we trained it on 30 hours of mi artificial mixtures of two speakers, uh, mixing around 0 dB, plus or minus 5 dB. And we had two different evaluations, because uh, we wanted to have some kind of baseline for this, but we couldn't find anything um, handy that was uh, good enough. Um, so uh, what we chose as a baseline was to, to say, okay, let's train NMF models for each speaker, using all of that speaker's uh, training data, and then we'll use an oracle to tell us which two speakers we've got in there, and we'll use those NMF dictionaries. They have like 10 frames of context, so they're actually fairly powerful NMF things. Um, Non-negative matrix factorization for those of you uh, who don't know, it's just, you know, we have a power spectrum, and it's easy to describe that as a sum of a bunch of basis functions that are non-negative. Um, so that's our, our sort of oracle baseline. And we could evaluate that on the closed speaker set, but we couldn't evaluate that on the open one because it's, uh, we don't have a good method for that. Um, so, uh, so let's go through the results that we've gotten so far. So uh, the global clustering is a little worse than the local Oracle clustering. So uh, 
Uh, Oracle, k-means, that's where we do individual chunks and then find the best permutation. I should probably say Oracle permutation, I guess. And then global k-means is doing k-means on the whole thing. So we lose a bit going from this, sorry, this is a SNR improvement in decibels. So we get, you know, around six and a half dB overall for things that are mixed around zero dB. So we're improving somewhat is not ideal, not the, what you, you'd like to have, like, 30 dB, I guess, <laughs> ideally, 10 would be nice. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's still preliminary results. Um, but anyway, uh, it's kind of interesting that the global one works at all, because we really expected things to be shifting over time, and we only trained it on local chunks of 100 frames. Uh, so evidently, there's enough sort of common information that's more like speaker ID type of information in the embeddings that allows you to do that. Uh, but you do lose something, and we'll see more of that uh, later on. We also did a singular value decomposition um, to try to do something sort of spectral clustering-like. Uh, also, you know, you can think that on the sphere, k-means and uh, SVD are pretty much the same thing. You know, they're doing almost the same kind of um, estimation. Uh, one's just a relaxed sort of version of the other. And that had no effect, really. So, and then if, of course, an interesting thing is like how many embedding dimensions do you need to do this? And it seems relatively insensitive. Our, our best was at 40. Um, one thing I didn't mention about the structure of the network is that we, uh, actually the output layer of the uh, LSTM was at 10H function before being projected from the hidden uh, vectors of the LSTM to this output embeddings, embedding uh, dimensionality. So, so there's some kind of like limiting going on first, and then we have a projection. And we tried setting that to logistic. Um, why we didn't uh, just do, try a linear version of that, I'm not sure. Um, but we didn't. So uh, uh, kind of revealing is the results on gender. So it's like um, we can consider the different combinations, male and male, female and female, male and female, and, and all together. And you can see, like, really, actually, the male and female is doing great, um, doing really, really well. Even surprisingly, even better than this Oracle NMF thing by by a fairly large margin. Um, but the, it suffers a lot with male and male, female and female, and uh, particularly um, the global uh, k-means is is just starting to really lose a lot of the benefit, and. Again, it kind of makes sense, like, now you've got same gender, so a lot of those may be even close to same speaker, you know. Some may be more different from each other, two male speakers, some may be more similar. And if you're relying on this global information that was only trained on 100 frames, like, maybe the network can't really put in enough information um, on the basis of 100 frame training to really tell the difference between one male speaker and another very well. But still, still doing something, so it's uh, encouraging. And then uh, I, I guess I didn't really emphasize this before, but we're, we're not losing much going from closed speaker set to open speaker set. Obviously, you can't do that at all with the NMF, with the Oracle speaker ID. But uh, um, basically, it means that our model is pretty speaker independent. It's not really relying on the IDs of the 80 speakers that are in the training set. Um, Male, female, female results flip from close to open. Is that just chance? Think? Like yeah. We're better for females in the close set. That, that is a bit suspicious. <laughs> um, but I think it must be correct. Actually, yeah, that's a good point. It's, it is, it's a bit suspicious. Because actually, my theory for why female, female works better is. Uh, just because um, the harmonics are further apart, you know, easier to separate. And um, uh, we use relatively small windows. We should have used windows large enough that you can actually see the harmonics of male speech, but we use 25 millisecond windows. So it's getting, uh, getting tough to see differences between the harmonics for male. Um, OK, so let's uh, just hear some results, see how it goes. A loss wasn't Michael unexpected, Schwartz, given continental operational difficulties that developed in the quarter. This okay. A loss wasn't unexpected, given continental operational difficulties that developed in the 
Michael Schwartz, a partner at Watchtown Lipton, upset. So pretty, uh, pretty good for something that has no language model, you know, no separate models of individual sources at all, just kind of training on this um, mixed uh, situation. Mr. Day. Steinman, the beer European newsletter publisher, has been a American source of trade baby boomers got hooked on US Corona comma, because they can put lime juice Europe's in it. Current Mr. Steinman, the beer newsletter publisher, has that American baby boomers got hooked on Corona because they can put lime juice in it. And so, just for comparison, the the current Mr. Steinman, full pace of European deregulation doesn't really work. The American baby boomers got the U.S. Congress, Congress, which finds Europe's in current. Those two speakers are really close. Uh, so even though it has two different dictionaries trained on just those speakers, it's just impossible to separate based on individual templates of the speakers. OK, so then three speakers, we actually tried that, just fed in the same network of mixtures of three speakers and just set the clustering at the end to have three clusters instead of two. And uh, we do pretty well. I mean, this is sort of uh, comparable to some of the male, male, or female, female numbers. Um, it has a male, male in it. So it's sorry, sorry. Oracle NMF means you pick the right speaker. We pick the, the speaker dependent model. The models for the basis corresponding to each of the speakers. DC Oracle means you just know across segments which cluster is speaker one versus two. Yes. So like cluster yes. two in this segment is because segment to segment the cluster can flip. Yeah. So you just put it the right one. Okay. Depends on the initialization yeah. and if it's arbitrary, it's, it's permutation independent, so you, you can flip. Yeah. This, this. Just an arbitrary clustering that comes out of each one. And then this, this one is just running the full global thing on the whole utterance. So if we were testing on individual chunks, then I guess like these would be more similar, right? This one would be better because the Oracle uh, clustering for one chunk is the same as the non-Oracle clustering for one chunk. So the embeddings for speaker one on chunk one, there should be similar to the embeddings on the same speaker on a different chunk, right? Or no. Well, they can represent the local information, right? So there's, you know, there's like the pitch contour and what phoneme is happening right then. And so, could you overlap the chunks to get better permutation information? Yes, yes, you could. We did that? originally um, extract overlapping chunks, but uh, Joe, uh, the, he's the, he was an intern at the time who did this. He he just sort of threw those away because they were taking up too much disk space. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> It's fine. You know, we did, we, I, like I said, we did try a method that uh, actually considered consistency across those and um, in, in a nice framework. And it, it didn't do as well as the Oracle, but I, th I believe it was be a bit better than the global one. Uh, I don't know why we didn't go with that. It just wasn't ready yet, I guess, at the time of printing up these results. But you, you can imagine solving these problems with you know, some smart way of linking things up, you know, dynamic programming kind of thing across time. So that's the picture I showed before. So what do the embeddings mean though? That's an <laughs> interesting question. Like we would really like, we wish we could do like the sort of inceptionism like uh, explorations of what kind of crazy sounds uh, these things respond to, but we, we haven't tried or don't really know how to do that. Um, uh, this is just looking at, um, so that's the um, mixture, mask, and these are the sort of three different randomly chosen embedding dimensions. So you can, you can make a, an, a spectrogram out of an embedding dimension because it has a value for every time and frequency. Um, so somehow these correspond to what we're seeing in the input. But uh, we were hoping to see something like, oh, this one's pitchy and this one's like looking at onsets. You can't see anything like that. One reason that it's hard to interpret these is what I was saying before is that like the, uh, the V, the embeddings are really rotation invariant. So if you multiply V times a rotation matrix, call that V tilde, then V, v tilde, V tilde transpose equals V, V transpose. So no, no matter how you rotate them around, and so you're gonna lose all the meaning of any particular node in the embedding by rotating it. So that kind of gives us almost no hope of <laughs> understanding. 
But I, we, we can try to straighten them out or detect something, or maybe even, at least just look at the output uh, matrices and see what kind of patterns they have. And it's kind of a weird thing, right? You've got 600 nodes. Each of them is just multiplied by a matrix to get out to this whole embedding space. So each of them sort of has its own embedding. So if it's 0, you don't see that embedding. If it's 1, you get that embedding in your output as one part of a sum. So looking at what those are uh, might be interesting, but. So in some frequencies you have, uh, during the silence, you have like some embeddings are like firing. You have certain patterns during silence, I'm not sure. Yeah, so uh, what, what I didn't mention so much is that, uh, but sort of bef mentioned before, what we do for the silence is we just put a weight on the objective function during training that says, uh, we're just going to ignore those uh, silence bins. We don't actually care which uh, source they belong to. So we're not going to train the network to, to try to come up with a good embedding for the silence. Because you can tell the silence by looking at the mixture, just have a threshold kind of thing. And then at test time, we just also look at the mixture, pick that silence threshold. And then we, we don't, when we do the clustering, we don't use those values to determine the cluster center. So we do a weighted k-means, and we just ignore them when doing the m step of the k-means. We just don't include them. So uh, uh, let's see, probably close to out of time, but uh, just go through what, what we did a little bit this summer um, uh, in the workshop that uh, many, some of us were involved in. Uh, there were, was an idea to try to use microphone array input for this because uh, you know, this thing, it's kind of a really tough problem. You're looking at a single spectrogram and you're trying to tease out which parts of it belong to which source and just by the pattern of the amplitudes, it's, it's very complicated because you don't know where one begins and one ends. It's a chicken and egg problem. That's why you have to iterate between masking and, and states. Um, uh, but if you had microphone array input, th then there's sort of directions in space that cause delays between the microphones and those delay patterns can sort of distinguish one source from another and at least uh, give a, a clue that could be used. Uh, so, but we want to now handle uh, this kind of permutation problem in the input. So we want to be uh, sort of independent of the microphone array geometry, ideally. Um, at the very least, be independent of the, the ordering of the microphones because that, that shouldn't have to do with the algorithm. So, so the approach that we came up with was to um, um, first, do uh, an initial microphone array sort of clustering algorithm it, that looks at the time frequency bins and clusters them according to their sort of plausible consistency with a set of delays between the microphones. So every pair of microphones can have some delay, and you can sort of detect these delays. And uh, uh, the, the uh, pattern of delays is kind of indicative of a particular direction of arrival or something. And uh, so clustering those things, you can sort of have a feature that differentiates between different sources. So then the way we use those clusters is we uh, use each of those patterns of delays to do beamforming. So we uh, use them as a kind of delay in some beamform with those particular time delays, and then feed in the beamform channel. So then you can hope that if there's a, a beam that's sort of pointing at one of the sources, uh, the values will be larger than in a beam that's pointing at a different source. And so the pattern across those dimensions indicates something about the clustering of the sources. So it's still not enough because you know the beams could be in different orders, uh, sort of arbitrarily, uh, because you're just using clustering now. And uh, unless you want to train on so much data that you you automatically learn a network that that is insensitive to the order that you put things in, probably your network is going to fit something to those orderings. And so uh, we wanted to just be completely independent of that. So we came up with a, a network architecture that kind of does, has local channels for each of the inputs. So at test time, you can have as many channels as you want in the input because they're all the same. They all have the same weights. And then from each of the local ones, we pool into sort of a global one. Because ideally, you want those uh, local channels to compare to each other because you need to say, OK, this one seems louder. Uh, than, than this one for this particular source or something like that. So, but you can't do comparisons without somehow having an indexing between the inputs. So to do permutation-free sort of comparisons uh, in a neural network, then we use a structure like this. So, uh, so uh, same color 
well, at least within one layer, same color means same weight matrix, so same parameters. So this one for channel one is actually the same network as for channel two. The networks are exactly the same. So how can they have different sort of information? Ultimately, we want to have be, be calculating different information. So the inputs are different, so that's a start. And then we use kind of a pooling to pool into a global unit and then feed back the global output into the individual uh, channels. So this way, uh, you know, this guy, for instance, can sort of compare its own representation to the representations coming from the other units. Or maybe here's a better example since it's going hidden to the pooling back to the hidden. So, th so this guy can, can see sort of how it's doing relative to the other channels, essentially. And you know, you, we don't know what kind of function it's learning inside, but at least it has a chance of learning something completely permutation independent. And this can be used for any kind of problem like this where you have, want to have permutation independence in the input. So that's pretty, that's pretty much where we left off. We didn't actually get to, get to really try this out yet. Uh, it's, just, it's just theory at this point. Um, but I thought I would throw it in there because it's like kind of a future direction that we already have sort of made some steps towards. Uh, so bottom line, you know, we're solving this output permutation problem. Multiple instances of the same type of source can be handled. You could generalize different numbers of sources. Maybe even you could imagine using this to train a kind of universal sound separation engine. If you train it on enough things and have enough capacity. Uh, there's no language model, no complex decoding process. The whole thing is very fast. It's just speed forward network. Well, so it's a BLSDN. But you can imagine doing a convolutional network that would just be feed forward. Um, and so we're working on this incorporating microphone array information. Um, so stay tuned for further developments. That's my talk. Any other questions? Oh, man, I got a lot of them. But uh, uh, do you think it might work for image object segmentation? Yeah. Yeah, it, that's, that's definitely uh, something we want to try. Um, I think that the, the uh, image segmentation literature is a little more vast than <laughs> the uh, deep network uh, source separation literature, so I can't guarantee that it, something like this hasn't been done. Um, there was something a little bit like this. The only thing that we found that was closest to this was doing um, uh, uh, MRI uh, volume segmentation by using a convolutional network to infer uh, affinities. The affinities were just adjacent affinities. So it was like you have a point in a, uh, in a cubic three-dimensional grid, and so you have six numbers to infer that are the local affinities. Um, and and that's, that's been done. Nobody's used like this kind of embedding approach that's like sort of has long, long reach. Uh, across uh, grids like this, but uh, I do think that it would be good for that. Um, in, in that literature, there are a lot of data sets that have a ton of classes. Right. So, you know, you can use more like class-based approaches right, right. in those so cases. Sort of maybe don't have a permutation problem per se because like, you know, the features associated with like pores are different than like person. But you know, I mean, they also and you want can train the network shot learning and I want like course here. So okay. here, like you know, the, the signal is the same difference. So then you don't care about the exact class necessarily. Yeah, I mean, there's kind of I, I use that uh, image class-based image uh, segmentation method as kind of an existence proof for this because you could say that vector of probabilities of each class that you would get out for each pixel. Uh, let's think of that as an embedding. Well, when things are in the same class, then it should match. And when they're in different classes, uh, they should be different. Um, and the advantage here is that now we can do this without having class labels. So there's a ton of objects that don't really have a class label. You know, if you see something on the ground, you know, you can pick it up without knowing what it is until you get a closer look. So, you know, we know that for human perception, it's not a problem at all to segment something without knowing what it is. Um, so. There's no reason you couldn't have data sets that have unrecognizable objects in them. It's just that they don't exist. There may be some that just have segmentations, but you know it has to be done by a human, so it's kind of a non-starter for me, at least. Um, 
for this stuff, we just, we just mix them together. So you, if you have n things, you have n squared training things. Places and then render, then you have something. Yeah, yeah. So depending on how realistic that is, that's, that's the only thing is the realism. Um, Thing. So like, I mean, it seems like this thing is pairwise. So if I have a real signal, and then I say, oh, I want to move away from this thing, but maintain the cosine. Like I want, I want it to be similar in the embedding, mm -hmm. but otherwise as different as possible. And then if you also do the inception thing of like preserving the local uh, yeah, variance so you don't get white noise. Uh huh. Uh -huh. What ha have you tried it? Do you get reasonable sounds? We haven't tried that. There's one tiny issue, which is that like the phases are kind of important in sounds in order to sound good, but it's okay. I mean, you could still, I think, learn a lot from it, and we could think about just optimizing the phases a little bit to patch them up. Yeah, I think something like that makes sense. Start with a sound, just one, and then try to stay in the same class, but get different. See what the equivalence classes are. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's nice. Because those guys are super famous. You know, the Inception guys like have an art exhibit now. That stuff is mind like, Right? Like, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I still haven't recovered from seeing those uh, videos of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, was, uh... it brings back bad memories. <laughs> 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 Flying under a bush after midnight. Um, so there's indeed. Um, Missing feature day. There were these methods where you could sort of, if you had the mask, right? You could basically impute. You could, yeah. You can, you can, what, and one way to impute was just basically by looking at local correlations. But it turned out that the, I mean, those correlations basically fell off pretty fast, beyond some I don't know, ten frames or something. And so it seems like you're trying to learn a spectral affinity over one second. So you're trying to learn relationships from you know. High frequency bin at time t to a low frequency bin, you know, one second later. Uh -huh. uh, maybe you know, not informative in reality. Or yeah. Difficult. I way. guess I mean, one. Can you? Do you think you'll just learn that those things are hard to do, or do you think you should? You can also come up with a waiting. Structure? No, no. I think that um, actually, um, this is this gets at a, a very key point that I, I didn't really hammer on very much, but it's it's actually really crucial to understanding how this can even work at all. Like there, there have been approaches to try to do spectral clustering of uh, mixtures of speech, in fact, before. So uh, Michael Jordan and Francis Bach had a paper on this using spectral clustering and you know training through the spectral clustering objective function. Um, but the features were, like you said, they're local and they're uninformed by that masking function. So the features kind of overlap with multiple sources potentially and. Actually, their whole method was problematic because they actually also had a pitch tracking algorithm as input. So, but in any case, uh, one thing that this is not doing is looking at local regions in the input. The only thing local is is that the output has a, a, an embedding assigned to each time frequency bin. The input it's looking at the whole spectrogram to determine that embedding for one time frequency bin, and for therefore for the pair. So. It's not as if it's uh, just looking locally and trying to match something that it sees at low frequency at frame one with something at high frequency at frame 100. Like it's looking at the whole thing and sort of classifying, do whatever, doing whatever it internally has to do to understand what that signal is and therefore where it must dominate. So it's kind of a global approach. We, we do think that one should try to do convolutional things. But we don't know how little context you could get away with. I think ultimately, by the time you get to the top, you should have, like, every embedding should basically be informed by the whole thing. I guess. But I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or we can just scare it and then make him talk to the word. Are you not entertained? <laughs> Okay, uh, well, let's thank the speaker one more time and call it.